Hello! Welcome back to Scheme Macros. Now, in the last session, which was episode 31, we started designing a macro for, um, for testing uh, divergent programs, uh, programs that can that were expected to go in an infinite loop. So <clears throat> we got the beginning of the, the macro and we're going to use engines to implement this. So from the transcript uh, from the last session, you know, we had some making of engines. So here's define engine to be make engine and make engine <clears throat> takes a thunk a procedure with no arguments and so you can make one you can make a thunk with a lambda nil or a lambda with no arguments wrapped around the expression that when evaluated does the computation you care about in this case we have omega um, the omega combinator that is sort of a canonical infinite loop in scheme okay so if you ever need an infinite loop you want to test something out with an infinite loop you just do this lambda x x applied to x that term applied to itself and that diverges. Okay, so once you have an engine from make engine, the way you uh, call the engine is you give the engine a, a positive integer, which is number of ticks of fuel. And then you, you also pass in two procedures. The first procedure is a complete completion procedure that takes two arguments which is the remaining number of ticks that weren't used and the value of the computation. And in this case, we're just returning a list of, of both the ticks and the value. And then the other uh, procedure you pass in is the expire procedure, which takes a new engine that you can then call with ticks and a completion procedure and an expire procedure and keep going, including recursively, like in a recursive loop. Uh, and in this case, we're just returning um, the symbol engine ran out of fuel. Okay, so we ran ran that, and, this, and in this case, of course, we should see engine ran out of fuel because that's an infinite loop. And the purpose of having this sort of macro is because in Mini Canron, we often have programs that we expect to go in an infinite loop. And so if that behavior changes for some reason, we want to know about it. But of course, using a regular test macro isn't going to work well because if the program goes in an infinite loop, the call to the test macro just will never return. So we're going to use engines so that we can bound the amount of computation. We will have timed preemption. And we'll be able to say, okay, for a certain number of ticks, run the computation. If it if the computation finishes uh, with the, you know, the completion uh, procedure gets called, then we know the expected infinite loop or divergent computation finished it finished unexpectedly, and we can do something like signal and error. Um, if, however, the engine runs out of fuel, well, that's expected, and that means the test passed. So we'll sort of reverse, um, you know, maybe what you would expect for a regular regular um, test macro. We're going to sort of reverse how that works. So I, I gave this as a um, homework problem or challenge for you to define your own test diverge macro um, using engines and chase scheme. And like I said, Racket has also a version of engines. Uh, the interface is, is somewhat different. I think that ties into what they call like their event system. Um, but you can also make similar sort of things work in Racket. I'm not sure what other scheme implementations support um, engines natively. If you look at the scheme programming language fourth edition by Divig, he's got a section on implementing engines using continuations. And in the last in the last uh, video, we also looked um, at references to a couple papers that talk about engines using continuations. So um, it's possible to define this in other other versions of scheme. Okay. So uh, if you want to take the challenge, now's your time to pause the video and come back after you've defined your macro. Um, otherwise, 
And let's go ahead and, and implement this. So from an interface standpoint, we can already see that our test diverge differed from the previous diverges because we don't have an expected expression. We don't have an expression we're gonna evaluate to find the expected value to compare that value with the value from the test expression. So the interface is different. We just have a name and the test expression. We could also have an amount of fuel. So and you'll, uh, this would be a simple interface, a simple to write the macro, where we would say the macro just expects to take a certain number of ticks of fuel all right, and so if we're going to do that, we could do something like um, let E be uh, make engine, and then remember we have to thunkify our test expression, stick it in lambda nil. Okay, uh, so this call to make engine, which takes the thunk, will return an engine E. I don't know, I'll call it eng. Okay, so now we've got an engine, um, and now we can try uh, calling that engine. So I'll just grab this expression since we've already done it. All right, so ticks of fuel. Well, that's just going to be fuel. Uh, the completion procedure and the expire procedure. Okay. So if uh, the completion procedure is invoked, that means that, that the test expression actually completed. And we're gonna say that's an error. Uh, how did we do this before? Let's look at how we, how we print it out. I think we did a format, right? So test, okay. So let's do something similar in spirit. So error will be in test diverge. That's the name of our macro. <clears throat> um, this is kind of redundant that I'm saying test diverge. Okay, so here's my format string. Um, divergent. Test. 
test will have failed, expression converge to value whatever uh, instead of diverging. Okay. So how many tilde S's do we have? We got to make sure we got one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So we have, let's start this. We have the name. We already have that. Uh, we have the expression. Okay. Let's uh, do our... <clears throat> Do, do, do. Okay, so this is interesting. So we have to be careful here. Uh, remember before we had a let and we evaluated test expression? We don't want to evaluate test expression right away. We want that thunk to wrap around it. But we do want to have the quoted test expression here. So we have to be careful that we're not evaluating test expression more than once and you know, try to, to keep the number of times the expression appears in the macro output to be small so it doesn't explode. Um, all right, converge to value, uh, to value V with <clears throat> T ticks remaining out of fuel ticks to start. Okay, this is the completion procedure. Okay. All right, so let's look at the tilde S. Okay, the name, the quoted expression, the value the number of ticks remaining and the amount of fuel that started. Okay, that looks right to me. Great. We'll get an error at runtime if this, uh, if the number of tilde S's in the format string don't match the number of arguments here. So got to be a little careful. We'll, we'll test it out. Okay, so uh, however, <clears throat> If um, the number of ticks expires without, you know, if that computation expires, the engine um, ran out of ticks, then we're good. So how did we do that before? So we just said uh, return the symbol past. Okay, so you could do more sophisticated things. Like I said before, you could do something like have a counter, a global uh, variable that you update. So maybe, yeah, you, you, could, you could have some sort of... Uh, test suite form or every time you run the test suite you re you restart the global counter you know you set bang that number of tests passed number of tests failed to to uh, zero and um, and then run a whole bunch of your you know test macros and then every time a test fails or a test succeeds you increment this global counter and then at the end you could print out information instead of halting right now we're just going to error out if there's a problem and if there's not a problem we'll just return um, quote pass we could also print something out that the test had passed but you know anyway you, you could play around with this various ways it, it's up to you to decide what sort of interface you want uh, but as far as I know this is a working test diverge function now or uh, macro so we can try our test diverge Let's just try it, something simple. All right, so remember, it takes a number of ticks, so a thousand, and then it takes an expression. And okay, so so the cool thing here about this uh, test, uh, the test diverge being a macro is notice, like we don't have to quote test expression or wrap it in a thunk or you know play any games like that because the macro itself is going to you know expand to code that will place the test expression within this thunk within the lambda nil um, so uh, so we don't 
we're not cluttering anything up with having to wrap lambda nils around this. So it that's a nice interface. Um, yeah. Okay. So there we go. So that is a use, and we should see if it works or not. And then, uh, and then we can have one that uh, finishes. So let's say. I don't know. I'll just have half of omega. So this should evaluate to a procedure. And so the first one should pass and the second one should signal an error. Okay. And we can also put in some divergent mini Kenrin examples, but let's just try loading this. So this file is, I've called epi0034. Okay. Something happened. Looked like we got an exception in test diverge, divergent test finishes failed. Expression lambda x, xx, converge to value procedure. Okay, so this is uh, Shea saying that the file and the, I guess the, the character position where that expression came from. With a thousand ticks out of a thousand uh, fuel, a thousand ticks out of a thousand fuel remaining. Instead of diverging. Okay, well, my <laughs> my my message might not be the best. Let's just like at least put in a new line. Okay. But you get the point. Diverging with uh blank out of blank ticks uh ticks of fuel remaining, whatever. All right. So uh, that seemed to work. So let's go ahead and all right, I'm going to comment this one out for now because I don't want the test to fail. So let's put in like some some mini Kenrin. Mm. Let's call it. Uh, we could do this like always o never o thing. Always O, never O. Okay. So let's say, uh, let's just do like a little always O. I don't remember if this is defined in mini, in faster mini Kenrin, but we can just define it. So here we're going to have a goal that, um, you know, unifies hash F with hash F. Okay, so that, uh, actually that's just succeed. Um, I don't think we want to do always, so never, oh, let's see. So always, O oh, has to be recursive. Um, let me think here. So in my dissertation, I pointed out, I think five types of infinite loops you can get in mini -Kenron. Uh, which one do I want? Let's just do never o. Never o is kind of silly, but it it works fine. So the never o is going to be a relation. Oh, okay. and we have this define relation, right? So we can do define relation. Ah, so that's going to be a top level. That's going to be like a define. All right, let's see when we figure this out. Let nil uh, define relation never o. And we went to this syntax. Never o is not going to take any arguments. And when you call that relation, what is it going to do? It's going to call never o. All right, that's kind of dumb. Uh, but that should be an infinite loop. I think you'll agree. We're just going to call ourselves forever. I think that's right. So let's do a run one. Q of, um, I call it a never all. And I'll try this uh, at the top level just to make sure that this does what I think. But let's do that. 
just try this. Uh, well, it looks like infinite loop to me. All right, let's try doing the test diverge. Passed, great. Now, of course, we can up this number, the number of ticks. Okay, we can keep making it bigger, order of magnitude increases. Okay, apparently uh, Shay can do a lot of ticks in a second. All right, so that one was noticeable. There was a little delay there. Make it 10 times bigger, so this is gonna be a few seconds. Okay, great. Now, mini Canron programs could do a lot of work. So maybe it's, you know, maybe you've got a mini Canron relation and a call to that relation. It's not really divergent, it's just taking a long time. Uh, so for a program synthesis task, for example, that'd be quite common. Maybe it takes 10 seconds or 30 seconds. So you can change the number of ticks here to um, you know, be larger or smaller. And if you're, like I said before, if you, um, you know, wanna have more confidence that this really is diverging, maybe you wanna add another zero or two and run it you know, overnight along with other tests. But if you are, um, you know, uh, if you're in a different mode where you're, say, writing the reason schemer, uh, in addition to the reason schemer, and you're doing this, you know, you, you probably don't want to wait. Uh, if you have lots of tests, you probably don't want to wait 10 seconds if you're, uh, you know, dealing with uh, running these tests on a regular basis. You probably don't want to wait 10 seconds for this stupid test. So, you might want to have a much smaller number of ticks. And in fact, one of the things we did with the reason schemer was we had some infrastructure so that whenever we LaTeX the book, whenever we built the book, all the tests would run. So I wrote Perl scripts and things like that that would extract from the LaTeX the tests. And then we would have tests like this. I had like a test diverge macro, something like this. And so if we had an expected divergent expression that we said in the in the book would diverge, I would automatically generate this sort of code and then run it. Uh, and that was very important because we had so many, you know, expressions um, in the book, and we claimed so many times that this expression produces this value, and we said it so many different ways that we really needed some infrastructure because the, the design and implementation of Mini Canron was changing as we wrote that first edition of the book. Um, so this sort of infrastructure was important. And so that's why we had this test diverge macro, something basically equivalent. Now, uh, because it's kind of annoying to have to go through all your tests and update this number, I didn't actually uh, use the interface we just built. I didn't actually have the macro um, use use a number of ticks, or maybe I should say I had an alternate interface. So, <clears throat> um, so one one thing we could do is we can have more than one match clause, or sorry, one more than one pattern. I mean. Okay, so here is a pattern that takes three arguments, name, fuel, test expression, in addition to the name test under uh, test hyphen divert and diverge. Remember this underscore uh, is really a placeholder for test hyphen diverge. So we could create a different pattern that doesn't have the fuel number, okay? Uh, so we could do something like well, one thing we could do is we could say, well, we're going to call recursively to the test diverge macro, and we're gonna insert a default number of ticks. Okay, so it is possible to call test diverge now and not give ticks. So if you don't give the number, uh, if you don't give the number of ticks, then what will happen is um, the macro will be called with a thousand ticks. So we could do something like that. So we can now make the, the amount of fuel um, optional from an interface standpoint. And okay, so that should work. 
We could also have some sort of global variable. So there are different ways we can do this. We could say, um, let's do this and define <clears throat> diverge ticks. Okay, and maybe by default it's a thousand. So maybe we do something like say, Actually, I'm going to do a trick where I'm going to stick these in what's called a box, which is like half of a con cell. Okay. And I call this the diverge text box. I put earmuffs around global variables. So, so the, the, these uh, asterisks, sometimes people call this earmuffs. Uh, that's my notation that this is a global. And I'm sticking the value in a box. All right. So what I could do is I could say, I'm going to unbox um, what this value. So here, here's the global variable. So I can refer to the global variable. Let me just show you this. So it's, um, it's more concrete. Okay. So if I look, uh, if I reference this global variable, well, that's the representation of a box. I can call unbox. and I get the value in it. And I can also do set box bang, and I can set it to be 2000, okay? So this box is like half of a console. You can think of it as like a tiny, tiny list. It's a tiny list that contains, you know, it's like a list of length one in a sense, but a list actually is a cons pair whose cutter is the empty list. So this is smaller. This is like half a console. So it's, it's pretty typical if you're doing this sort of programming to, to stick things in a box. And that's uh, that has to do with uh, keeping track of the evaluation rules. And, you know, if, if I just made this a thousand, then if I ever have an expression that uh, whose evaluation refers to this variable, well, then it's just plopping a thousand there. But if I have a box, I can pass the box around or pass, pass a pointer to the box around. Um, and then at any time I want, I can check to see what is the current value of the box. So it's, it's, uh, more dynamic. It's uh, late, late binding as Alan Kay would say. All right. So, so this lets us look at what's in the box at any time and we can update it. And so I could, um, you know, for, for the reason schemer testing, uh, I would have sort of two testing modes, sort of like this is the fast and dirty testing. And then here's like the real testing that I would do occasionally. And the real testing would set the number of ticks to be really high. And those tests might, you know, might take an hour to run or 10 minutes or something like that. And then I'd have, we're in the middle of writing a chapter version, which is okay. Anything divergent or, you know, if there's a, if there's a synthesis test that takes five minutes, you know, I would, have a version of that test where it's like, well, we'll run it with an engine. And if it doesn't return within the number of ticks, we won't count as a failure. We're just like, ah, eh, we don't know. Okay. So, so it allowed me to, um, to put as much computation as I wanted towards the testing. And then I could up, up, I could up those ticks or I could go into a different mode and say, okay, I really want to run this until it completes without an engine for a, say a synthesis task and for the divergent ones, I want to run those potent, you know, expected divergent. I want to run those for lots of ticks. So this is uh, one way you could do it using this box technique. You could also, um, you know, you could abstract over this. So we could have accessor functions that, you know, uh, update the box, you know, sort of a little more, more abstractly. Uh, we could have a function that, that we call for fast testing, which sets the box to be, uh, you know, you know, we could do something like define, um, fast test mode where we're going to set uh, box bing. To one. And then we could have a, Um, maybe 
careful test mode where we set the box to be some big number. I don't know, um, maybe 10 to the eighth. I don't know how many ticks is right, but we could do something like that. And now we have functions that we can call. Uh, and so we could call functions in different test macros. We can do all these sorts of things uh, as abstractions. So that's, you know, build a little interface over it so I'm not doing box manipulations and directly uh, messing around with global variables. I could do that kind of thing. Um, well, let's make, sh make sure it works, you know. Uh, as I say, trust but verify. Okay. Okay. So let's go here for Nevero that passed. All right. Let me grab my Nevero, the REPL. Okay. And let's go up here for our globals. Where are they? Here we go. So I can say set fast mode. Test it. Okay. That's fast. Set the careful test mode. That's slow. So we can make it a little, little faster. I mean, a little more computational time still. Yeah. So, um, yep. Do, do, do. Where was it? Right there. Nope. That's not what I want. I don't want ticks. Gonna be careful here. So that also works, right? So the tick version also works still. Mm, did I grab the wrong one? No, no, it passed. All right. But now I can go back to the fast tick mode, fast test mode. So so I'm evaluating those expressions in Emacs. Yeah, now it's fast. Okay. So I can just do a procedure call. I can do it at the REPL, right? I can do the procedure call within, you know, the expanded code of a macro or all sorts of things. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way you could do it would be to use what are called parameters. Okay, so Shea Scheme and Racket support parameters, which are um, kind of like this global technique, but that has a, has a somewhat maybe cleaner interface. Um, so that would that would be kind of the software engineering-y way to do it would be to use parameters. Um, so that would be another way. So if you want to play around with that, look it up, look up uh, parameters in Shea Scheme. Maybe we'll do that at some point. In any case, we now have a working uh, test diverge macro that actually has two different interfaces. So you can either explicitly give fuel but if you don't explicitly give fuel, then the amount of fuel given to the engine will be whatever is in this diverged te uh, text box um, uh, thing. And, you know, we can even add a little more uh, abstraction here. So we're here, we just do um, an unbox. Okay, so have a little, little uh, procedural abstraction. And so every time, instead of calling unbox, uh, we just can call it get, we can just do that. Okay. Trust but verify. Let's make sure it worked. Now, if I really want to be careful about these things, I'll stop Shay. Okay, I'll stop Shay scheme, um, and I'll restart. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm dealing with global state at this point. I'm dealing with mutation and these macros that, as I said before, you have to be a little careful about the order in which these things get evaluated if you're at the top level. Uh, so let me just go ahead and rerun everything from scratch and make sure that it all worked. Okay, and make sure that my two different modes work. Okay, so that was a fast mode. Let me do the careful mode. Okay, let me go back to fast mode. 
Okay. So that all seems to work. Okay. And now we've got a little macro. Now, one thing Mac, uh, Michael Ballantyne has pointed out, and uh, for the next macro I show you, which will be uh, the alternative run interface, you know, he definitely had this critique, which is for that macro, I was expanding to huge gobs of code where I could have used some helper functions. Okay, so everything was in the macro. I could have could have done uh, things with external procedures. So in this case, you know, really the only thing that you have to have the macro for would be thunking the test expression. Everything else we could stick in a helper. So, um, yeah, let's just try this. Uh, let's try one more thing. See if we can abstract over this macro and uh, make the macro have less stuff. And the reason you might do that is if you're not careful, you know, the code can ex ex sort of explode in how much code you have. And uh, you know, especially if, if you have duplicate code, if you have maybe lots of of uh, tests, you know, this, um, all of this kind of boilerplate code is going to be copied over and over again. Then rather than if you had say one, uh, globally defined procedure, you just copy or so you just call out to, and if the code gets too big, then, you know, that, that can really slow down compile times and blow various caches and things like that. So it's actually good, you know, the sort of the next level up is, uh, trying to not put things in macros if they don't really need there need to be. So so here the really the nice thing uh, to me about the macros well is is that the test expression doesn't have to be wrapped in the thunk. Okay, so that's that's nice. Um. So great, and uh, and and also the the other the other part of it that we want. Uh, to be a macro is that we want to see the quoted original test expression, not just the value if it if it uh, evaluates a so value. So there are two reasons uh, to use a, a macro here. But that doesn't mean that all of this code has to be uh, in the expanded code. like it could just be a call to a function. So another way to do this, so so really there are only two things that we need if we think about it. So we want this lambda. And we want this quote, right? That's it. Everything else isn't actually necessary. Um, it doesn't have to be in the macro itself. It could be in a procedure. So let me uh, let me try refactoring this. So let me comment that version out in case I mess something up. And what I'm going to try to do here is pull this out, and pull it out here. Okay. And I'm going to replace all this with a call to uh, test diverge helper. Okay. So now we have test diverge helper. And for right this second, I'll just pass all this in. It's not quite right, but um, it's kind of the the um, the right idea. So we're going to create a procedure. Okay, I'll do the MIT uh, style. Like I said, the the arguments aren't quite right, but this will get us started. There are a few different ways to do it. If I was doing something really complicated, I might take a, a slightly different approach to writing writing the helper, but in this case, I can just change it a little bit. Um, okay, so we need the name and the fuel. <clears throat> okay, so test expression isn't quite right. Okay, that's not quite right. Um, so what we need is the quoted test expression quoted test expression. We need that. And then the other thing we're going to need is the test thunk. Thunk. Remember, a thunk is a procedure of one argument. So this thing is the test thunk. 
And this thing is the quoted test expression. Okay, so let me split my screen so we can kind of look at, at the two parts. So we have the test diverge. Okay, so what we really need to pass in here is um, the test thunk and the quoted test expression. Well, the test thunk is just this lambda thing. Okay, let's grab that, plop it in. And then um, we want the quoted test expression right here. Okay. And it's getting a little long, so let's uh, wrap it onto multiple lines. There we go. All right. So at this point, um, test diverge helper can just be a regular procedure. It doesn't have to have anything to do with macros. The only thing we really need to expand to is this macro, I mean, this function call. All right. So we can replace this thunk, uh, the creation of the thunk, with the thunk that was passed in. Okay. And uh, the quote of test expression, we can just replace with quoted test expression. All right. And I do believe that if all of my reasoning is correct, uh, this should work, okay? Okay, so now notice our macro is much shorter. I mean, I can make this, uh, you know, kind of kind of a one-liner. I, I picked long names, so if I hadn't picked uh, names that are quite for as long as, as this had been TE instead of test expression, for example, um, usually this would have all fit in one line. So metaphorically, this is a one-liner. Um, you know, just if you want it to fit on one line for, for each of these clauses, just pick shorter names. But that's the basic idea. So I've commented out test diverge. Okay, so let's see if this works. I'm going to stop Shay. Very important. Very important when doing this sort of work. If you're in a library, that might be different, but if you're um, loading files and dealing with top level. So let's see. Okay, well, I didn't see any errors. Okay, all right, the never o passed. Uh, make sure that the function that finishes gives us an error. Yep, that gives us an error. And uh, let's go ahead and try our other Okay, so there's our never row. And now let's go ahead and change the um, between fast and careful. So let's go ahead and do careful test mode. And by the way, we should be able to see, yep. Okay, so now it's small. If we go to fast test mode and evaluate that, starting fuels tiny, careful test mode. All right, so we got all the fuel in the world. Um, so now we can try or never row again. And I could teach Emacs how to indent test diverge if I want. Um, all right, so that seemed to work. Uh, the other thing we can look at is the expansion. So if I, uh, so now test diverge is quite short. So if I expand this use of test diverge where I'm not actually giving the number of ticks, I could say expand that. And let's see what we get. Okay, as usual, we have all the gen simming and stuff, so that's, uh, let's turn that off. Print gen sim hash f. Okay, so here what's happening is because we have the run uh, and the, the relation definition and all that, um, you know, we still have a lot of code. We're seeing really mini Canron code. So let's uh, make this simpler. Instead of, you know, let's just do our omega again. So, um, actually, let's do simple, okay? I'm going to say the expression is 42, okay? The expression is 42. Let's just try to keep the simplest expression as possible. We don't want to get into complicated scheme code and expansion. We just want to see what the macro is turning into. So we can see the macro call is... Or sorry, the macro call expands to a call to this helper function, test diverge helper with the name. Um, now we're checking the box to see how much uh, starting fuel is currently in there, grabbing that, passing that into the helper. And then uh, we've wrapped 
you know, plus uh, 42 in the thunk. And then we have 42 there. That is okay. Uh, let me, let me try something a little more complicated just to make sure the quoting's working and all that. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so Shea uh, uh, optimized away quote 42 to be 42 because uh, uh, numbers are self-evaluating literals. So here you can see that, um, yeah, here's Shea, here's Shea being Shea, uh, times 3, 4. We have the quoted expression, and then we have the optimized version where we're using the built-in uh, version of times. <clears throat> okay, so there's a little optimization there that Shea did. Okay, great. So that's a much simpler uh, expansion than if the expansion included, you know, uh, all, all of the code that we pulled out uh, into the helper. So here's here's the full one we started with. So if I if I define again, all right. So now if I expand it, so you can see, you know, if I do the verbose version. Um, you can see that all the engine stuff is there and the, and the format strings and, you know, all that and the, uh, in the expansion. Um, so it's not wrong. Uh, however, if we had a whole lot of tests or we started nesting macros and that kind of thing, we could end up in situations where we just have generating huge amounts of code. You know, in this case, probably doesn't matter. Uh, but there are cases where it does make a difference. So, um, you know, that, it, that, that refactoring skill is important. It's important to be able to think that way. And in general, you know, the, the idea is if, if you have something that could be a, a procedure, then use the procedure. Okay. Use, use the macros when you need to change the evaluation rules or you need to change the syntax, but then call to a procedure as a helper. Um, that's that's a general rule. Okay, uh, I will check this file in. I'll check in the transcript as well. Um, and uh, the next time I'll show uh, the, the the alternative run interface from Mini Kenrin that feels more like Prolog, where you can get one answer at a time. Um, but anyway, I'll see you then. Bye bye. <laughs>